bat over here, so it's not in my way. Um, all right, all right, round zero, here we go. Official introduction to the introduction to the introduction. Um, hi, <laughs> hi and welcome. This is a virtual presentation on revolutionary Terrytown. I'm Connie Kehoe, Constance Kehoe. I serve as president of Revolutionary Westchester 250. Um, needless to say, I am thrilled that so many people are joining us today. The RW250 mission is to build awareness and enthusiasm for Westchester County, New York's crucial role in the American Revolution. So here with RW250, we're spearheading the local effort. And that's a part of an ambitious national 250th anniversary of the conflict. And that's in full swig in six years. Uh, some of you will remember the bicentennial, the 200th commemoration in 1976, but for the 250th, we will make sure that the crucial role of Westchester County, and yes, Terrytown for sure, is not ignored and that the many lesser known stories, including those of women, native people, people of color, all those stories, all those stories are fully told. And I am, there's the other thing, I am determined I'm not promising, but I am determined to get a large scale reenactment of the Battle of White Plains here in Westchester in 2026. So stay tuned to that. Um, all of this, these efforts, my efforts, they're very much driven uh, by volunteers. And I hope you will consider, if you're on this uh, meeting with us today, consider joining in some way the commemorative effort our RW250 website link will be added to today's webinar chat room in a minute. And on that link, you can learn about local projects as well as the evolving plans for the entire state of New York's commemorative programming. Your involvement, big or small, in your local community is absolutely the key to a satisfying and inclusive commemoration. Ah, so. Today, the spotlight is on one particular village in Westchester, Terrytown. Eric Weiselberg, also known as Dr. W, will take you with him as he examines two critical events in Terrytown during the revolution. Um, you'll see on the screen here. The first event we call Traitors and Spies. You probably know these words refer to Benedict Arnold the traitor, British officer Major Andre the spy, and you will know about the fort at West Point. But for today, the story's main focus is on the Patriots who captured the spy in Terrytown. I expect, I really think, because I always learn something, you're gonna learn something that you didn't know at the beginning of this. So the second episode um, uh, we call Patriots and allies. And if you take a look at this little painting here, you're gonna see the Terrytown Wharf, the Hudson River, 12 French soldiers, and until an artillery piece, you see some British ships, there's one burning. You're gonna hear all about this from Eric. The sequence of events was in July, 1781, and we call this the action at Terrytown. Um, there's a memorial today. You can visit this when you take a tour with the with Sarah's Historical Society. Um, perhaps there is a, a memorial there in front of Village Hall about this. And you know, I think when you start thinking about the significance of this, you may be pondering the battle, the famous battle of Yorktown that followed some months later. So, so Dr. W will be starting his presentation uh, with a little introduction about Terrytown during the eight years of war here. And he'll end with that Hessian ghost, the headless horseman and that exciting tale that will be at the end. Um, it's gonna be about a 15 minute Q and A. And just let me say something about the co-sponsors. 
Warner Library has been a gracious and fantastic host and everybody will virtually clap at the end of this um, for, for their efforts. Also the Historical Society serving Sleepy Hollow and Terrytown, whose executive director, Dr. Sarah Masha will introduce our speaker. And finally, um, the Hudson River Patriots chapter of the DAR, Regent Philomena Dunn, will be sharing some brief remarks. But first, on the next slide, I want to quickly draw your attention on the next slide that Eric's in charge of <laughs> to, to um, um, a resource that we've just completed at Revolutionary Westchester 250. These are informational videos. It's a, it's a free resource for you to explore on your own at your leisure. Um, and we're calling it Explore Westchester County's Revolutionary War Sites. Um, now you look down there, you'll see first Patriots Park is one of our videos. That's a great follow-up. It's a perfect follow-up to today's talk. Um, if you were actually with us in Warner Library, you would be right next to Patriots Park. Odell House Rochambeau headquarters. This one is, is an important historic site. It's about eight miles from Terrytown. Uh, they are currently fundraising for a major restoration. And today you're gonna hear a little bit about General Rochambeau. Now the other three is Phillips Manor Hall, Bedford, uh, it's about the burning of Bedford and then the place on the Hudson Kings Ferry for Planks Point in Cortland. All of these are researched by Eric Weiselberg and funded by Westchester County. We have many wonderful supporters and helpers at the county, including Mary Jane Shimsky, who I saw was signed up to, she's our legislator, signed up to be part of this, uh, the participants today. So um, there are many other important sites across Westchester, but that's all for another day. <laughs> so right now, uh, will you please welcome Philomena Dunn. Um, Philomena? Uh, thank you, Connie. Hudson River Patriots chapter is very happy to be part of this group. I just wanna let people know a little bit about Hudson River chapter and the Daughters of the American Revolution. For those who do not know, the Daughters of the American Revolution was founded in 1890. Yes, 130 years ago. It is a nonprofit, non-political, volunteer women's service organization. We're dedicated to promoting historic preservation, education, and patriotism. Today's DAR consists of over 180,000 women and 3,000 chapters across the United States and around the world. Any woman 18 years or older, regardless of race, religion, or ethnic background, who can provide a direct line of descent from a patriot of the American Revolution is eligible for membership. A patriot is a man or a woman who provided military, civil, or patriotic service in achieving American independence, starting at the Battle of Lexington in 1775 through the withdrawal of the British troops from New York in 1783. Hudson River Patriots chapter is centered around the river towns of Westchester County. Um, Eric, next slide, please. Chapter has marked the graves of Isaac Van War in Elmsford and Miller in White Plains. We supported veterans by sending gift boxes and cards. We participate in veteran ceremonies and we held talks on women's suffrage movement as well as local history. One of the happiest events for the chapter during the pandemic was when the New York State Daughters of the American Revolution awarded the 2020 New York State Outstanding Teacher of American History to Dr. Eric Weisenberg. <laughs> Our chapter has sponsored w, Dr. W for this award. For more information about joining the DAR, go to the DAR website, 
to submit a membership interest form or email me directly. Now, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Sarah Marsha. The Hudson River Patriots chapter is very lucky to have Sarah serve as our chapter historian, which as Sarah is the executive director of the Historical Society serving Sleepy Hollow and Terrytown. Over to you, Sarah. Well, thank you very much, Philomena, and thank you, Connie, for putting this together. I really appreciate it, and I, I can't tell you how much this means to the Historical Society because this is what we do, and, and uh, especially for Terrytown and Sleepy Hollow. Um, just looking at this picture that you have in front of you of the Old Dutch Church burying ground um, is just wonderful because this is where we actually give tours. And on our tours, we visit many of the people that Erica is going to be talking about this afternoon. So um, it's exciting for us um, on our tours to do that, um, and it's exciting to keep moving. So um, as um, on behalf of Revolutionary Westchester 250, the Hudson River Patriots, the Warner Library, and the Historical Society serving Sleepy Hollow and Terrytown, I would also like to extend my welcome to everyone. And since we have such a wonderful topic today, as well as I can see numerous participants, I wanted to let everyone know the procedures for asking questions at the end of the presentation. Many of you may have Q&A on the bottom of your screen or chat at the bottom of your screen. Um, just if you have a question, please, uh, when we get later on, <laughs> use the chat function or the Q&A function to put up your questions uh, to me. Um, and then when we get to the question and answer um, session, I will do my best to make sure that all of your questions get answered when we discuss um, at the end with Eric. So thank you for that. Um, and um, now on to the introduction. So Eric, um, Eric Weiselberg received his PhD in history from the University of Oregon. Following his completion of his studies, Dr. W, as he is now known, and you've heard many people mention that, returned to New York where he began teaching in the social studies department of Irvington High School. There, he works to really connect with students um, through his enthusiasm for history and particularly American history. Uh, he tries very hard to find new ways and exciting ways to bring history, um, especially local and regional history, into his classroom. So you just heard from Philomena that Eric was nominated by the Hudson River Patriots chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution for the 2020 Outstanding Teacher of American History contest. Well, he won New York State just recently, so yay, Eric. <laughs> um, and now he's on, on to our national contest. So um, we're looking forward to hearing the news about that. So outside of the classroom, Eric has also been working to bring the stories of our local history to the public. And that's actually how I met Eric. In my role as executive director of the Historical Society, Eric has often come to research at our library and archives of the society. And there we typically end up going offline and, and, and really off topic and talking about every other research topic in the room and maybe other, another tidbit of history that we've heard recently or just run across while we're doing our research. A couple of years ago, Eric enthusiastically took on the role of principal historian for the Revolutionary Westchester 250. And it's in that role that he's speaking to you today on a topic that I'm sure many of you know is very near and dear to my heart and particularly close to what we do here at the Historical Society. Revolutionary Tarrytown, traitors and spies, patriots and allies, British boats and Hessian goats. Ha <laughs> ghosts. <laughs> so without further delay, I'm going to present Dr. W. Welcome and good afternoon. Thank you so much for all of those wonderful introductions. I'm glad you could join me today here on the banks of the Picantico River. Today we're going to examine the history and legacy of the Revolutionary War in Tarrytown. Zooming in on two key events that contributed to victory and the achievement of the independence of the United States, and which also left a lasting legacy on the American imagination. That would be, of course, the capture of Major John Andre by American militiamen at Tarrytown, and the action at Tarrytown, the first combined military action between the American and French armies, and a link in the chain of events that led to American victory in the war. First, we'll explore some background into revolutionary Tarrytown. And afterwards, of course, say some words about Hessian soldiers and headless horsemen pertinent to the region. The Revolutionary War literally put Tarrytown onto the map and into the history books. 
The area was usually referred to as either Phillips Manor or the Manor of Phillipsburg. But in 1775, as hostilities approached and political lines were already being drawn, the name Tarrytown first appeared in the books. A record of September 2nd, 1775, names Abraham Storms as the captain and Joseph Appleby as second lieutenant, elected for the company that was known as the Tarrytown Company. One of many in the 1st or South Battalion of Westchester Militia that were generally referred to as Phillipsburg Companies. Storms and Appleby declined, or perhaps served briefly and took up a new position, so that a record of October 23rd lists Glode Requa Jr. as captain, Cornelius Van Tassel as second lieutenant, and Sibbert Acker as ensign of the Terrytown Company. This map from 1777 depicts the British invasion of New York in the fall of 1776. It shows the village of Terrytown, you can see, and it shows you the larger area. It's labeled as Phillipsburg Manor. Here you can see Phillipsburg. That would basically be Yonkers. That would be the manor house of the Phillips. And generally the name Tarrytown was used in records of the time to refer to the whole place. Right now we might think of Tarrytown as a particular village, but basically anything between Dobbs Ferry and Ossining or from the Hudson River as far as White Plains into what we now know of as the town of Greenberg and the town of Mount Pleasant, they often refer to that as Tarrytown. From 1776 to 1783, Westchester County, including Tarrytown, was a battleground. Westchester's position relative to New York City placed it at the geographic, military, political, and economic center of the revolution. Control of the Hudson River Valley stood at the center of British strategy. After leaving Boston in 1775, the British occupied New York City throughout the war. Westchester was the northern approach to New York City and a critical source of food for both sides. For the duration of the war, General Washington kept his army alive in anticipation of returning to New York and delivering a decisive blow against British-occupied New York City. The village of Tarrytown stood some 27 or 28 miles north of the city, and consequently it became, along with all of Westchester, a major goal and scene of action from 1776 to 83. The Revolutionary War put Tarrytown on the map and Tarrytown put the United States on the map. In July of 1776, British ships sailed up the Hudson River, anchoring in the Tappan Zee off the shores of the village of Tarrytown, preparatory to the invasion of New York. That August, naval battles raged off the shores of Tarrytown and the river towns. In 1777, Tarrytown served as a landing port for British attacks on Forts Montgomery and Clinton in the Highlands intended to support Burgoyne's campaign, the British campaign in upstate New York. By 1778, the British had withdrawn from Philadelphia and came back to New York City. General Washington followed them back, crossed at Kings Ferry and set up camp at White Plains. Throughout 1778 and 79, Westchester and Tarrytown witnessed a new kind of warfare, petite guerre as they called it at the time, we would say guerrilla warfare as partisan bands of light mobile troops sparred in small skirmishes across Westchester's rugged terrain. The region also saw a war of neighbor against neighbor, patriot versus loyalist, also called Tory. Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Isaac Martling, who had lost an arm in the French and Indian War, lived at a house on Water Street in Tarrytown. On May 26, 1779, when a British raid was occurring in the region, he was carrying a pail of water from a nearby spring to his father's house when he was struck from behind by a Tory named Underhill. It was said that Underhill, uh, Nathaniel Underhill, had held a grudge against the Martlings, and here's why. Nathaniel Underhill had stored grain in his lofts while others had none. As a loyalist, the British and other loyalists left him alone, and he therefore held on to his grain. The Martlings, on the other hand, were patriots and the British or Loyalists had taken all of their grain. Thus the Martlings in need of grain asked Underhill to share, but Underhill refused to share with the Martlings. In retaliation, the Martlings tied Underhill by his heels in his own barn and made him eat oats. That is the reason given for why Underhill killed Isaac Martling. The epitaph on Martling's gravestone at the old Dutch burying ground reads, 
or at one point it used to read, because you can't really read it now, in memory of Mr. Isaac Martling, who was inanely slain by Nathaniel Underhill, May 26, A.D. 1779, in the 39th year of his age. Anyway, those are the kinds of things that were going on around 1776, 7, 8, and 9, around Tarrytown. I know it's one of the first of our big key events. On September 23rd of 1780, three militiamen, John Paulding, Isaac Van Wart, and David Williams, captured British spy Major John Andre in Tarrytown, thus rescuing the captured plans of the fortress at West Point and exposing the treason of Benedict Arnold. How did these men, now such an integral part of the American story, and beacons of patriotism, and well, what's the opposite of a beacon? Whatever that would be, of betrayal, come to meet. How did they come to meet along a road in Tarrytown? This is a story of at least two Johns, John Andre and John Paulding. In fact, see if you can make a list or count the number of men named John in this story. There may be a quiz at the end. Many accounts of this event begin with either the traitor, General Benedict Arnold, or the spy, Major John Andre. But I would like to begin instead with a Tarrytown native, John Paulding, and the story of how he stepped into history along the road in Tarrytown. John Paulding was said to be over six feet tall and notorious for his feats of strength. He grew up on a farm located just east of the village of Tarrytown at an area later known as East View. Let's take a look at the map. Now this is from 1785. It's after the war, but it's our best indicator of where people lived, in part because basically Phillips owned the land. Uh, every other farmer was a, a tenant, a tenant farmers. And after the war, when the lands were confiscated from the loyalists like Phillips, it was offered first to the tenant farmers who had been living on the land. So we can see over here circled in blue, there's the Paulding farm. It says J Paulding on it above and below the road there. And that, this road heading off would be uh, the East View exit off the Sawmill River Parkway. Obviously the parkway is not on here, but there goes the Sawmill River. If you kept going that way, you'd come across a place, well, you come across basically uh, Westchester Medical Center and uh, Grasslands 100C. Uh, however, back in the day, you would have come across Young's house. That was a Patriot outpost. That'll become important in our story later on. We head up north here, you see Buttermilk Hill. You can still hike there now, it's on the Rockefeller Trails. That will become important in our story. Moving over, let's come down to the bottom. Again, now it's the Tarrytown Lakes. Back then, right next to it, somebody scribbled in on the map, Captain Romer's house. So we're gonna meet Captain Romer, we're gonna visit Captain Romer's house in a little bit. Over here is the Bedford Road. If you've been to Stone Barns, that's the road that goes through the Stone Barns with the big open fields. Those of you who have been uh, reading our articles on individual profiles of Revolutionary War era people in the Hudson Independent may recognize the name Requa. So here is uh, Sergeant Daniel Requa's land. His son, Abraham Requa, was a private. Here we have a profile of him in the Hudson Independent. So there's Bedford Road. Again, that road is going to become very important in our story. Moving a little further over, there's the church. Uh, that's the old Dutch church. The Albany Post Road comes here. There's the mill pond you can see, and the squiggle there is the Pecanico River, which I'm sitting by right here. Okay, so we know the lay of the land. Oh yeah, and here's Kaikout Mountain. Kaikout is Dutch for lookout. Uh, that doesn't really play a role too much here. However, uh, you may be familiar with it as a place where the Rockefellers later lived. By the summer of 1780, John Paulding was a sergeant in the company of Lieutenant Daniel Peacock in the Westchester Militia. On patrol near Bedford in early September of 1780, he was captured and taken prisoner to New York City. This was the second of three times he was in prison during the war. Accounts of his escapes vary, yet they share common elements, including clothing that facilitated his escape, possibly a Hessian Jaeger jacket, green with red trim like those you see here. This actually is the wall of the Sugar House prison. Again, I'm not, we're not exactly sure is that the one he was at. The, the accounts are hard to tease apart. Uh, but this is part of the Sugar House prison at Van Cortlandt Park in the Bronx. After Paulding escaped prison from New York City, 
He returned to duty at the militia post at North Salem, auxiliary to a camp of the Continental Army at North Castle. Today's Mount Kisco, but again, also indicating the whole area around it. While there, his friend John Yerkes Jr. proposed an excursion. Oh, John Yerkes Jr. He said they should attempt to stop some cattle thieves, otherwise known as cowboys. By 1780, the war in Westchester had reached horrific proportions. Armed bands, many without legitimacy, roamed the region. The refugees were loyalists who had fled Westchester. Some of them formed militia groups and periodically came back up from New York City to steal cattle from local farmers and drive them to the British Army, hence the name Cowboys. To stop the flow of stolen cattle and horses from reaching British-occupied New York City, the New York legislature authorized Governor Clinton to establish a proclamation line behind which anyone was authorized to intercept stolen cattle. The profits were to be divided between the state and the parties making the capture. So with Paulding back at the militia camp around September 20th, John Yerkes Jr. proposed the excursion to Paulding. Paulding agreed on the condition that they get a sufficient number of men. And so, and Yerkes set about collecting the men while Paulding sought the necessary permit from the commanding officer. Many accounts have considered the militiamen to have been mere brigands or highway robbers acting outside of legal bounds and for their own personal gain. While the expedition was undertaken on their own initiative, on something akin to a day off and not part of their official military duty. And while there was a bounty to be had for seizing cattle thieves, nonetheless, their expedition was permitted and even sanctioned by the state issued proclamation. And they had received authorization from their militia commanders, including permission to carry their firearms. By September 22nd, six of them left camp at Salem. John Yerkes, John Paulding, Isaac Van Wart, Isaac C., James Romer, and Abraham Williams. Along the way at the Benedict house, they came across David Williams. He was enjoying a pleasant chat with Nancy Benedict, whom he afterwards married, when she pointed out to him a small company of armed men approaching. Williams recognized John Paulding as well as his cousin, Isaac Van Wart. He ran out and jumped over the fence to meet them. When they told him what they were up to, he said he would fetch his firearm and join them. The seven proceeded towards Tarrytown. They spent the night of September 22nd in the hay barrack at the barn of a John Anderson in today's Pleasantville. By the way, if you're counting Johns, this is the first of three times we're gonna hear of John Anderson. On Saturday, September 23rd, they decided to go to the home of James Romer uh, at his, their parents' house, Jacob and Frenna Romers. And they go there basically and uh, have, she prepares breakfast for them, Frenna Romer does. And they make their way out. She puts, the, uh, she puts lunch in a pewter basin and a basket. They go to Archer Reed's house, pick up a deck of cards, and use it to decide who goes where. Four would remain on the hillside. Three would go down on the road. And John Paulding, Isaac Van Ward, and David Williams went down the hill towards the Albany Post Road to take up their position, waiting for the cattle thieves. You can see I've already pre-marked here on Bedford Road the red arrow, which will be approaching soon. Meanwhile, another John was making his way towards Tarrytown. On September 20th, about the time that John Paulding was escaping from prison and acquiring the Hessian coat, British intelligence officer Major John Andre sailed up the Hudson River aboard the HMS Vulture. Good name, right? The Vulture. To meet with Benedict Arnold. Arnold had financially supported the Patriot cause, achieved a number of stunning victories, and was injured in the service. But when others were promoted above him, he resented it and turned to the British to receive monetary compensation and a promotion in the respect he felt he deserved. On Thursday, September 21st, Arnold sent a boat out with oars muffled with sheepskin to pick up Andre from the vulture. They reached shore at the foot of Long Clove Mountain. Negotiations between Arnold and Andre dragged on, and they were moved to the house of Joshua Head Smith, just northward in Haverstraw. Here we can see that. Uh, in fact, this is a uh, sketch that Andre himself made of the scene later on. And you can pretty much recap where it is, right? So we got Hook Mountain there. And I think that would be Long Clove Mountain, the one right there. And the furthest over to the right is probably High Tor Mountain. Uh, and the buildings and stuff in the background would be Haverstraw. And Joshua had Smith's house up in there somewhere. And now for the third thread of our story, 
about how John Paulding and John Andre came to be in Tarrytown on the morning of September 23rd. John Jack Peterson, that's right, John Jack Peterson, was born in New Jersey, but he was brought up in the family of Job Sherwood, who lived north of the old Dutch church. He was described in contemporary sources as colored and as mulatto, but it's unclear whether his status before the war was that of free or enslaved. When Job Sherwood's son Isaac entered the Continental Army, John Peterson asked to join with him. Isaac died at the Battle of Saratoga, but Peterson continued to serve until his discharge in 1780, after which he served in the militia. It was in the militia on the morning of September 21st that he was engaged in making cider at Barrett's Farm on Teller's Point. We know that today as Croton Point Park, along with 19-year-old Moses Sherwood, a cousin of Isaac Sherwood. The vulture, the British warship that had brought British Agent Major John Andre upriver for the meeting with Arnold, was anchored in the river. Suddenly, Moses Sherwood observed a landing craft filled with 20 or so armed British soldiers coming from the vulture, accompanied by a gunboat, a small craft with a cannon at its bow. Sherwood and Peterson seized their firearms and ran down to the shore to repel the British party. Hiding behind rocks, they waited until the barge came into clear view. Peterson fired, causing an oar to fall from the hands of one of the men on board the landing craft. Then Moses Sherwood fired a shot and the barge returned to the vulture. The gunboat fired cannon shot at Peterson and Sherwood, who were able to duck for cover and avoid injury. If you're counting, I think John Jack Peterson is our fifth John. By the way, check out our article on John Jack Peterson in the Hudson Independent online. Sherwood and Peterson alerted their commander, Colonel James Livingston at Fort Lafayette, which is at uh, current day Verplank. By the way, check out our video on YouTube of Verplank's historic role in the Revolutionary War. Anyway, on Friday, September 22nd, Colonel Livingston ordered a cannon moved to Teller's Point and fired upon the vulture. Now, of course, the vulture was Andre's safe passage back to New York City. This then left Andre stranded, and he was forced to return on land through hostile territory. Don't worry, Tarrytown, you had your shot too, literally. In addition to the cannon fire at Teller's Point, a cannon set up at a redoubt along what is today Church Street in Tarrytown also fired at the retreating vulture. Take that, vulture. So trapped behind American lines, the vulture having departed, Andre has to return by land. Andre and Arnold were afraid that Andre's officer's coat would attract too much undue attention, so Arnold provided him with civilian clothes. This too was taking a great risk since a captured officer would likely be held prisoner and later exchanged, whereas a captured spy would be hanged. Andre also had the plans to the defenses at West Point on him, as well as a pass to get through the American lines in the name of John Anderson. That's our second John Anderson. Andre left Haverstraw and crossed at Kings Ferry from Stony Point to Verplank. With orders from British commander Sir Henry Clinton not to enter American lines, nor to change out of his officer's uniform, nor receive or carry any papers on him. In less than one day, Andre had already broken all three commandments. Long story short, Andre made his way towards White Plains. He came across the home of Stotts Hammond, a miller at Clark's Corners, today's Pleasantville. Andre rode close to the well and saw young David and Sally Hammond, 14 and 12 years old. Andre asked for a drink and Sally filled a cup and handed it to him. Andre remarked on the excellence of the water and gave Sally a sixpence. The boy David held Andre's horse. Andre asked the boy about the likelihood of meeting American soldiers at Young's house, a Patriot outpost about a mile further on. The boy told him there was a party of scouts there at Young's house. Alarmed at the prospect of encountering the Patriot forces at Young's house, Andre turned around and retraced his steps. He then continued over the old Bedford Road onto Tarrytown Heights to the old Albany Post Road, which he followed towards Tarrytown. Since about 9.30 that morning, John Paulding, Isaac Van Wart, and David Williams had been waiting. Van Wart was picked to stand sentinel. While the other two remained hidden in the bushes, around 10 a.m. Van Wart saw a horseman coming along the road. Van Wart alert alerted Paulding and Williams, and the three men got up and got their fire locks ready. Paulding presented his firearm at the rider and told him to stand, and then asked him which way he was going. Paulding recently escaped from the British prison, wearing the Hessian coat that had been part of his escape, must have fooled the approaching man. He thought they were Tory allies. 
The man then told them he was a British officer who must not be detained. To his surprise, they said they were Americans and that he was now their prisoner. The startled man drew back, changed color, and let out a deep sigh, claiming that in fact he was an American officer, explaining he only pretended to have been a British officer because a body must do anything to get along nowadays. He said he was an American officer going to Dobbs Ferry on mission for General Arnold. He warned them, gentlemen, you had best let me go or you will bring yourselves into trouble for your stopping me will detain the general's business. Paulding asked the unknown gentleman his name and he answered, John Anderson. The man then pulled out General Arnold's pass, which permitted a John Anderson to pass all the guards to White Plains and below. As Paulding was the only one of the three who could read, he looked at the papers. When Paulding saw General Arnold's pass, he might have let the man go, except the man had, number one, previously stated that he was a British officer, which roused their suspicions, as did the fact that, number two, the pass was for the White Plains route, but Andre was on the Tarrytown route. They searched the man and found Benedict Arnold's papers and the plans to West Point in his stocking. The man offered the militiamen his horse and watch if they would let him go, but they did not accept the bribe. Paulding suspected the man might be a spy, and they determined to turn him in to their local commander. The reunited seven militiamen, with their prisoner in tow, went first back to the Romer house, which they had left earlier that morning. John Paulding went ahead and warned friend of Romer, Aunt Fanny, take care of what you say now. I believe we've got a British officer with us. At the Romer house, the party had dinner, and friend of Romer offered it to the captive. But the man assured her, Madam, it is all very good, but indeed I cannot eat. Now in the excitement of the capture and their eagerness to avoid the highway, the three men had forgotten all about the basket and the pewter basin with the lunch in it. Upon calling at the Romer house, they described where they had eaten and had left it. And friend of Romer sent her youngest son, John, mm -hmm, John, then 16 years old to fetch it. And he brought it back to the home. The militiamen, however, took off before young John Romer returned with the pewter basin. They took their prisoner to American headquarters, first at Robbins Mills or Wright's Mills at present day Kensico, and then to Sands Mills at Mile Square, present day Ormonk, where they met up with their militia commander, Sergeant John Dean. That's right, Sergeant John Dean. And then they delivered their captive to Colonel John Jameson in command at the post. Thus, Sergeant John Dean is often referred to as the eighth member of the team. I think if I'm counting right, young John Romer is number seven, Sergeant John Dean is number eight, and Colonel John Jameson is number nine. Unfortunately, the rest of this story is for another time. Suffice it to say, Andre was put on trial near General Washington's headquarters in Tapan, across the river, where he was hanged as a spy and Benedict Arnold exposed as a traitor. In 1853, once young John Romer, now old John Romer, pointed out the site of the capture, which he knew from retrieving the pewter basin, to a committee of patriotic citizens of Tarrytown who wished to build a monument to the captors. When the owner of the property objected to locating the monument on the indicated spot, the committee in charge accepted the offer of a piece of land nearby, donated by Mr. William Taylor, a former enslaved man who had purchased his freedom. James Alexander Hamilton, son of Alexander Hamilton, and his friend and neighbor Washington Irving attended the unveiling ceremony. James Kirk Paulding, Washington Irving's childhood friend and captor John Paulding's cousin, wrote the inscription, which praised the, quote, patriotism, which, rejecting every temptation, rescued the United States from most imminent peril by baffling the arts of a spy and the plots of a traitor. In 1880, on the centennial of the capture, the monument was upgraded and dedicated at a ceremony with 70,000 people in attendance. It included a new bronze statue atop the old monument, depicting John Paulding in the moment before the capture. The Paulding statue was a gift by a wealthy resident of what was then called North Tarrytown by the name of John Anderson. Don't let anyone in Tarrytown hear you calling it the Andre Monument. It's a monument to the captors and it's in Patriots Park. For more on that, see our entry about Patriots Park in our video series.
The American victory in the war resulted in large part due to the alliance with the French. Events that led to the end of the war began right here in Tarrytown. The French army under command of General Rochambeau arrived in Westchester in early July of 1781. They met up with the American army and set up the Phillipsburg encampment with 4,000 Americans, 5,000 French, and 9,000 total in a gigantic encampment stretching from Dobbs Ferry to just past White Plains across most of present day Greenberg. So you can see here on the map, there's Phillips or Yonkers where the sawmill enters. That's Valentine Hill. That's over by uh, Cross County Shopping Mall there. And there we have Dobbs Ferry. And further up we have Tarrytown. So the American camp stretching all the way across with Rochambeau's headquarters in a structure which still exists, barely, uh, but the Friends of Odell House Rochambeau's headquarters is working to restore it. To feed, clothe, and supply the Phillipsburg encampment, the Americans set up a system to deliver supplies, including flour and clothing, from New Jersey, Pennsylvania, West Point, and other locations by way of the Hudson River to Tarrytown, from whence it could be distributed safely behind the lines to the French and American soldiers encamped at Phillipsburg. On the evening of July 4th, 1781, several British frigates, including the 16-gun sloop of war Savage, arrived off the shore of Tarrytown with the intention of intercepting the American supply ships and destroying the stores. The British ships captured one American sloop loaded with 1,000 rations of bread for the French army. French without bread? Mon Dieu! As well as clothing for Sheldon's Dragoons, an American cavalry unit stationed at Dobbs Ferry. On July 15th, in the Tappan Zee off Tarrytown, those same British ships cut off several American river sloops carrying supplies. As soon as the American sloops discovered the British Army, they headed for the shore, but three or four of them ran aground 100 yards from the dock. As the Americans frantically unloaded the grounded sloops, the British ships dropped anchor and began a heavy cannonade, under cover of which they sent two gunboats and four barges to destroy the American sloops and to carry off the supplies. The only troops at Tarrytown were a sergeant's guard of 12 French infantry soldiers from the Soissonnet Regiment. Nearby at Dobbs Ferry, on the advanced right wing of the American camp, were Colonel Sheldon of the 2nd Continental Light Dragoons Cavalry Unit. Colonel Sheldon sent his mounted dragoons, including a company commanded by Captain George Herbutt, to Tarrytown. So this map is great. It's drawn by uh, the French, as you can see. Right here is the Pas de Frégate, the way the frigates went. Uh, and across the river. So now we call Dobbs Ferry, well, Dobbs Ferry, but across the river is originally what was called Dobbs Ferry because that's where the Dobbs family lived. And the cartographer even sketched in the little lines, right, to show you boats go back and forth here. Uh, and you can see some of the readouts and stuff that were built along Dobbs Ferry and the encampments that were there. And over here is the main American camp, essentially where Ardsley High School is. And of course, Tarrytown. Colonel Sheldon sent his mounted dragoons to Tarrytown to join the sergeant's guard of the Soissonnet. When Sheldon's dragoons arrived, they assisted with taking the supplies off the grounded sloops. Twelve men of the dragoons under command of Captain George Hurlbut took up positions on board one of the sloops which had run aground. Armed only with the swords and pistols of cavalry soldiers, Captain Hurlbut kept his men concealed until the enemy were alongside, at which point he ordered them to fire. The British fired back, killing one of Captain Hurlbut's men. Hurlbut, finding himself surrounded, ordered his men to jump overboard and make for the shore. The British boarded and set fire to the American sloops. The British soon retreated, owing to the fire kept up by the American dragoons and the French guard, who waded into the water and kept the British from landing on shore. The fire on the sloops, however, threatened to destroy the supplies on board. So several men watching from the shore jumped into the river and swam for the burning sloop, including Captain Hurlbut and two others, Captain Lieutenant John Miles and Quartermaster Lieutenant Joseph Shaler. When they reached the burning sloop, they extinguished the fire, thus saving the vessels and most of the cargo. While Captain Hurlbut had been in the water, however, he received the wound from a musket ball through the thigh. The British ships remained in the river within sight of Tarrytown for the next two days while the Americans removed their stores. 
French cannons were placed at Dobbs Ferry and an American cannon at Tarrytown. On July 17th, the American cannon at Tarrytown fired upon the British ships, forcing them upriver. On July 18th and 19th at Teller's Point, I know, you know, that's Croton Point by now, the British ships sent their gunboats ashore and burnt several houses there and at Haverstraw. On July 19th, taking advantage of fair wind and tides, the British ships, including the Savage and several others, returned downriver. At Dobbs Ferry, the French battery fired at them causing chaos and a tremendous explosion aboard the Savage. The action at Tarrytown received praise at the time. General Washington in the general orders of July 19th complimented the gallant behavior and spirited exertions of Colonel Sheldon and Captain Hurlbut of the second regiment of dragoons, as well as the other two men. In addition, the combined efforts of the American and French army sent a message about the potential of the joint army. This first feat of the American, oops, this first feat of the French arms in America gave the English some idea of what they were to expect from the united efforts of a whole corps, remarked French officer Abbe Robin. It proved of great strategic importance too. The commander of the Auxon artillery, which had fired upon the savage from Dobbs Ferry, noted 45 years later, my action, among others, on the North River against two English frigates so completely deceived the English general who was in command at New York that he straightway sent orders to Lord Cornwallis in Virginia to send him 1,500 men from his army to New York. Thus, the presence of the combined army's siege artillery at Tarrytown and Dobbs Ferry during the action at Tarrytown convinced the British leadership that the Americans and French intended to put all of their efforts into an attack on New York City. As a result, they concentrated their forces on the peninsula and the British doomed their army to the pincer movement being carried out by the Franco-American forces traveling from the Phillipsburg encampment by land and the French fleet arriving into the Chesapeake from the West Indies. Thus, the action at Tarrytown played a key role in the chain of events leading to victory over the British at Yorktown on October 19, 1781 the battle that effectively ended the war and laid the groundwork for American victory and the independence of the United States. When the depot plaza at the Tarrytown Riverfront was being redone in 1899, a memorial tablet was placed in the Tarrytown Railroad Station, a location that would have been roughly the location of the action itself in the water before the landfill extended the shoreline. That tablet now stands in front of the new village hall. The research came from a Dr. Coutin, who said about, uh, who thought that the efforts of Captain George Hurlbut and others had been overshadowed by the attention given to John Paulding. He said, the fame of Paulding and his associates so completely obscures that of all other patriots whose names belong to the history of Tarrytown during the revolution, that the latter are seldom mentioned in connection with the time or the place. the part you've been waiting for. Because a study of the Revolutionary War in Tarrytown would not be complete without inquiring into the headless horseman of Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. He was described as the ghost of a Hessian trooper whose head had been carried away by a cannonball in some nameless battle during the Revolutionary War. In fact, Irving's story has many references to the Revolutionary War, mostly forgotten or omitted in adaptations popular today, but which gave the story its rich historical resonance that probably would have been recognizable to earlier audiences. We have to remember though that Irving's tale was a literary construct, not a history, nor a recording of folklore. So let's take a moment to separate fact from fiction when it comes to Hessians in Tarrytown and Westchester. The term Hessians refers to the 30,000 German troops hired by the British during the Revolutionary War. Most came from the Principality of Hesse Kassel, about 17,000, although others came from Braunschweig, Hesse Hanau, Ansbach Bayreuth, Waldeck, and Anhalt Zerbst. So there's a little map of present day Germany with the current German state of Hesse uh, outlined for you in red there. The Hessians made up about one third of the Crown forces. They were called auxiliaries, in German, Hilfstruppen, right, helping troops. Uh, they were not mercenaries, 
a mercenary is a foreign individual in the military service, suggesting private gain. But it's common practice or custom to call them mercenaries, in part because it suits the propaganda view that was directed against them by American rebel leaders at the time. American propaganda exaggerated the threat of Hessian soldiers to Americans. In the Declaration of Independence and other official announcements, Hessians were depicted as cruel cannibals who slaughtered children and were alleged to have come to America to cause destruction and to enslave the population and return them to tyranny and despotism. In fact, Germans fought on both sides. The Pennsylvania Dutch, who were German and not Dutch, and the Palatine Germans in upstate New York were German settlers already living in America who served in the Continental Army. In fact, many of the French army were German. The DuPont Regiment was from Zweibrücken, two bridges, right, and was entirely German. Three battalions of the French Grenadiers and Chasseurs were German. Half of Lausanne's Legion, a cavalry unit in the French army, was German. All of the French artillery was commanded in German, and the rank and file probably also contained many Germans. Also weiter. Any Teschens in Tarrytown would likely have been Jaegers, probably from the German principality of Hesse Kassel. The elite troops of these Hessians were called Jaegers, a German word for hunter, with connotations of rifleman or ranger. Their ranks consisted of men who previously might have served as gamekeepers, huntsmen, or foresters on estates of noble landowners. Jaeger companies were essentially light infantry. They acted in support roles, scouting ahead of the main army or covering retreats. In Westchester's no man's land between the lines, these skills came in particularly useful. The weapons technology of the time, flintlock muskets with bayonets, required coordinated movements and therefore dictated that military companies take to open fields and soldiers wear brightly colored uniforms so as to better coordinate their complicated maneuvers in linear formations. Jaegers, on the other hand, were armed with rifles, whose accuracy meant that they were not required to fight in linear formation in open fields. While regular Hessian soldiers wore blue and carried a flag or colors, the Jaeger wore green jackets faced with red, which facilitated their ability to move throughout the forest without being noticed, and Jaeger companies had no flag. In 1778, the Jaegers that had been at Philadelphia with the British Army returned with the rest of the British Army to New York City and to Westchester. In 1778, they were reported taking wheat and hay from local farmers and putting it on board vessels in the Hudson River at Phillips Manor Hall, at today's Yonkers, destined for the Crown Forces in New York City. One report noted, about 200 of the Greens, the Jaegers, and about 100 horse was up as far as Tarrytown, plundering everybody in their way. They have robbed and plundered the inhabitants in a most cruel manner, stripped the clothes of the children of many families, and haven't left them an atom's worth of anything to subsist on. There is no distinction made between Whig and Tory. So you see the ferocious uh, reception and depiction of Hessians. Despite this ferocious depiction, they could also be seen as sympathetic victims. Hessian soldiers were auxiliary troops, professional soldiers in service to their prince and in turn to the British crown, with no love of country to motivate them. In a way, Americans and Hessians, although on opposite sides of the conflict, were similar in that they both fought against a tyrannical ruler who, in a sense, had sold them out. And so during the war, many Hessians deserted. Over 3,000 of the 30,000, so 10%, settled in America after the war. It would have been easy to do, as many Americans were German-speaking. One fictional Hessian, who never returned to his homeland in Hesse, was described in Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Irving wrote it in 1819 while he was on family business in England. Although Irving grew up in New York City, he had been to Tarrytown in 1798, escaping a yellow fever epidemic. I think we can all relate to trying to avoid an epidemic. So he knew the landscape and the landmarks, such as the old Dutch church, and he knew some of the families of Tarrytown. Indeed, Irving was related by marriage to two of the captors of Andre. Irving's older brother, William, was married to Julia Paulding, a cousin of Andre captor John Paulding. Irving's sister, Julia, was married to Henry Van Wart, a neighbor of Andre captor Isaac Van Wart, a neighbor, a nephew. He was probably a neighbor too. In 1819 in England, Irving spoke with his brother-in-law, Henry Van Wart, formerly of Tarrytown, and reminisced about old Tarrytown, including stories about some of its residents. 
As for the Headless Horseman, it is often said that Irving listened closely to local folklore, old stories brought from Europe by Dutch settlers, or even new ones that may have emerged during the colonial period. But that's just not supported by the evidence. Instead, Irving read European literary sources with various supernatural horsemen, and he transplanted them to familiar places in Tarrytown. Were there any headless Hessians during the Revolutionary War? Yes. In fact, two accounts of the Battle of White Plains describe someone losing their head by a cannonball shot, one of them being a Hessian. But it's unlikely that Irving consulted these written sources while he was in England on family business, writing the legend. Irving did not get the horsemen from local folklore, but he did draw on a rich historical legacy and popular memory rooted in the Revolutionary War. Irving effectively captured both aspects of Hessians in America, their fear-inducing reputation for cruelty and violence, as well as their ability to evoke sympathy for their unjust condition of servitude. Irving mobilized the Hessian, Hessian horsemen to forge a metaphorical link between Major John Andre and Ichabod Crane. Both Andre and Ichabod are English or Yankee outsiders. They both encounter native country lads of Dutch descent, both of which are dressed in Hessian garb, John Paulding and Brown Bones. And these country lads of Dutch descent dressed in Hessian garb prove the un their undoing and drive them out of town. One part of why Irving's legend is so successful is that he evoked a terror in the American psyche symbolized by the fates of the so-called unfortunate Andre and the terrifying but exploited Hessians, which had been grafted onto the landscape of Tarrytown by the experiences of the Revolutionary War and later memorialized in Irving's fiction. So the horseman itself is not from Tarrytown, but perhaps like many Germans who settled in America after the war, it did find a home here, a naturalized citizen, if you will, free of its revolutionary era heritage and put to new commercial and entertainment purposes. It now rides with abandon along the highways and byways of Sleepy Hollow and Tarrytown. In 1894, a monument was dedicated in Sleepy Hollow Cemetery to the soldiers of the Revolutionary War. With the money raised by local subscriptions, it was placed next to an old readout, which during the war had been manned by a militia company and it overlooks the grave sites of many of the soldiers down below in the old Dutch church burying ground. As to why Tarrytown had been able to erect a monument while other communities had failed to do so, one observer at the time commented on the favorable circumstances of Tarrytown. The historical interests of your town and its rare legendary lore have added enormously to the attractiveness of your natural advantages and made it the home of more millionaires than any other town of its size in America. In closing, as we have seen here today, the Revolutionary War not only put Tarrytown on the map and into the historical record, but the experiences and developments of the war in Tarrytown contributed to victory over the British and to the independence of the United States. In that way, Tarrytown put the United States on the map and the legacies of revolutionary Tarrytown have left a lasting impression on the American popular imagination. Traitors and spies, patriots and allies, British boats and Hessian ghosts. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Sarah, any questions? Well, thank you, Eric. Yes, we have a few questions today. Um, and I'm hoping that more will come in, but we're going to start with some of the questions that are in the chat. Now, um, you had mentioned when you were speaking about um, uh, lots of lots of uh, lots of information <laughs> about all those Johns. But actually, before we start the questions, I do want to welcome um, our County Executive George Latimer, who's actually uh, listening to and watching uh, this wonderful presentation that you just gave. So um, welcome, George, and, and thank you for joining us today and for all of your support for Revolutionary Westchester 250 and for history in Westchester County. So I did want I just want to bring that up. But now, as far as your names and uh, families and all that information you, you gave us today, um, one of the first questions actually was, um, did you say that the Dobbs family lived on the other side of the Hudson? Yes, because Molly Dobbs Sneedon, uh, so the Sneedon family married into the Dobbs family. 
And the Dobbs family was originally on this side, and that's how the Dobbs Ferry originated. At the time of the revolution, Molly had married into, see, am I getting this straight? Uh, <laughs> hey, Connie, you know better on Molly Dobbs Sneedon. You, you, you're, you're good at tracing her story. She married into in case, yeah. The Sneedon and the Dobbs intermarried. And at the time of the revolution, the, where the house was, where Molly Dobbs and that family ran the family, was on the other side where they ran the, the where they ran the uh, and they ran the ferry back and forth across. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. right. Well, I you're no, more I of an expert than I am, Erin. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's very much on my mind to be sure to include stories of women, whether they were loyalists or patriots or not telling. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to tell their stories too. Hey. Sarah. That's right. And, and, Mo and Molly Dobbs Sneedon uh, was an enterprising woman. She ran the ferry operation. We know that from business records that she kept. And right at the start of the war, the, um, the Patriots, so-called the rebels by the other side, basically kind of like rounded everybody up and said, you have to sign these what were called association articles. So are you with us? Are you against us? And so people were forced to take sides. And many of the locals were uh, driven into loyalism because of the aggressiveness of some of the rebel leaders. In any case, uh, really early in 76, before even the British invasion, the rebel leaders had noticed that some of the Dobbs family were uh, conducting business with their ferry with either British or with loyalists. So they put them on uh, basically a blacklist and said, don't anybody have any business or anything to do with uh, the Dobbs family? Now, as it turns out, one of them, Molly's son, John, remained a patriot the rest of the Dobbs and the Sneedons kind of took off, went to Canada and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, you know, records are scarce. So one speculation is Patriot John was truly a Patriot. Another is they needed somebody to keep a foothold on the ferry operation. So mm -hmm. he you know, professed his allegiance. They kept the ferry operation. And as it turns out, many of them returned again from Canada and, and were a presence there for quite a while. And for a while, the place was called Sneedon's Landing. And uh, pretty much now it's called the Village of Palisades. Okay. Well, thank you. So here's another question. Um, eating and talking about the, uh, the action at Tarrytown, if the three <laughs> swimmers could put out the fire on board the ship, why hadn't the crew been able to? Oh, so when, what the three swimmers put out, so, so here's another case where, boy, the records are spotty. Uh, yeah. Even the painting, the, the beautiful David Wagner painting, uh, it's entitled, I think, July 16th. Mm -hmm. The best I can figure out in my research was the night before was the 14th. Most of it happened on the 15th. It's possible that it was the night of the 15th that the first attack occurred and most of it was the 16th. Honestly, I just made an executive decision. Seemed to fit. Uh, so the records are spotty. Um, that being said, it was a sloop which had run aground or at least was in the harbor area that everybody left because the British were coming over. And this was like the fourth step or so in it, right? They went back out. So around step one or two was, they're trying to unload the supplies. Then the British show up. Then everybody gets off the sloop. Then the British leave because the fire of the French and Americans. And now the sloops are unguarded and unoccupied and nobody's on it. So the three guys swim out because the sloop is still has the stuff on it and it's burning. So they swim out to get it off before it's burning. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, here's a couple of, here's one, um, actually just a statement that somebody made that he has a friend who uh, is descended from John Anderson, the mulatto who fired upon John Andre. Um, the land is in Enfield, New York, as part of the land grants to those who served in the American Revolution. So there's just a little bit of information to pass on to you, Eric. Cool. So, okay, so um, let's see. I have a question over on the other side. At the time of the war, were the boulders along the, uh, the shore of the harbor area or were they a later addition? You're talking about in Tarrytown. Um, I'm assuming right. that's, that's what the question is. Yeah, when that's you're the question. Talking. And the boulders are a later addition, most of them. Some of them, yeah, are, I'm, so, <laughs> I'm just gonna throw yeah. that in there for you to say, you know, yes, a lot of the, uh, you know, as they filled in the shoreline along Tarrytown, they did use some large riprap and some other boulders to actually hold yeah. and, and keep the shoreline in place. So yeah. that's a little in, bit in fact, the question. Yeah. So, <laughs> so back back then, the shoreline was basically, let's see. So there's like a, a little fire department. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, if you come down any one of the hills, there's a fire department or the, one of the, far the pharmacy. If you're kind of on the northern end, the pharmacy, mm -hmm. like that's where the water line would have been. So if you're on any place near the water at the village of Tarrytown, that's relatively flat, you would have been in the water during the revolutionary time period. It, it like was really steep that's the, the, where it went to the water. So um, Richard uh, brought up one question um, in the Q&A. Uh, when one or more of the captors of Andre applied for the pension in, um, he has 1820, <laughs> a little bit earlier, um, yeah. Benjamin yeah. Talmadge, uh, to Benjamin Talmadge, the head of the Washington mm -hmm. Spies, then a US Senator, um, he was told that he used his position to deny the, that, the pension to the ch captors. Is there validity to the claim that the three militia were not reputable soldiers at the time of the capture of Andre? And yes, I am holding my tongue. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll let question. you take that one, <laughs> you know. Good question and excellent self-control, Sarah. First, <laughs> let's address Talmadge. Yes, it's correct. He was a senator later on. He oversaw the whole thing. In fact, that Colonel John Jameson, he, uh, whether it was a mistake or he didn't know or whatever, he was like, well, why don't I send uh, these incriminating papers plus Andre to the guy in charge? And who was the guy in charge of the whole area? General Benedict Arnold. So Andre was already well on his way to get returned to Arnold. And of course, this would have tipped off Arnold, like, dude, they know about your stuff. You better get out of here. As they were like halfway along on the route, then uh, Talmud shows up and says, you did what? Because maybe Benedict Arnold was part of it. They had enough suspicion at that point. So they recalled Andre and brought him back. Although the notice went to Arnold and Arnold did get the notice and said, I got to get out of here. And he got on the vulture and he was safe and he went back to England. Um, so Talmadge had seen all that. Talmadge also developed an affinity for Andre when Andre was a prisoner. He was enamored with the way Andre would walk back and forth in the prison cell. Uh, so anyway, so Talmadge kind of liked Andre. A lot of people at the time liked Andre. They saw him as an unfortunate victim. He was educated, cultured, uh, and a lot of people saw the three militiamen as uncultured, right? Backwoods, uh, rubes or hicks or what have you. Anyway, so that was Tal Talmadge's, what he knew about it, and if you will, maybe his biases. So once it came, and the three captors were given a medal, uh, and they were awarded land, and they were awarded a pension. By the way, the land uh, is in Peekskill and Van Cortlandville. And that's why John Paulding is buried up there. Maybe I have a slide to show you that. See if this will work while I keep talking. Boom, 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 boom. I do. There it is. So in the upper right is the John Paulding Memorial before they cleaned it in Van Cortlandville outside of Peekskill. That's why he's buried up there instead of, say, Tarrytown. Uh, let's see. What was I talking about? They get, so they got their land and they got the metal uh, and they got a pension. But sometime like around, I think it was 1819 or so. 17. 17, John Pauldy and the others said, you know, cost of living going up. We can't live on this pension. We'd like some more. Well, at that point, Talmadge said, whoa, hold on. These guys were just doing their job. They already got plenty of stuff. Anything that was special or unique that they did, they've been rewarded with their land and the medals and the pension they already have. We don't go around giving awards to people who do their job. They were doing their job. Uh, and against that, the residents of Tarrytown and the families of the Van Warts and Paldings and Williams scurried all over town and got giant lists of signatures. It's actually a cool record for knowing who lived where and what, because everybody's, I, I swear, Isaac Van Wart deserves it. Please give him all that stuff. And James Kirk Paulding, Irving's friend, was one of the major ones. A lot of the literature we have from James Kirk Paulding, you know, maybe it wasn't that good. It didn't stand the test of time, um, but he would put Paulding as a character in a lot of his stories. Uh, I think it was one called The Backwoodsman, in order to show him as a, a noble country character, uh, and in part to raise public awareness so he would get that pension. Uh, in the lower right here, we have Isaac Van Warts, again, before they have cleaned it. That's in present-day Elmsford. And on the left is in Schoharie County, at what's called uh, the Old Stone Church. Mm -hmm. um, that's David Williams. Uh, had some land over in the Tuckahoe area that the Ward family lived on. He eventually sold it and moved to, I think it was Livingstonville. Uh, he even moved after he died. So he was buried. And then some people were like, we want him in a more central spot. So they lifted him up, and buried him uh, <laughs> under cover of night and reburied him at the Old Stone Church. Mm -hmm. Eric, can I just interrupt? 
The sure. two monuments on the right, as you said, have been cleaned and everyone should go see them because they're now beautiful. Yep. And thanks yes. to the local um, government areas to doing that. Yes. We got lots more questions, Eric. So we got to keep our answers a little shorter. So, okay. <laughs> so um, here's the next one. Um, somebody, um, uh, there's actually, I'll, I'll, I'm going to jump back and forth between the Q&A and the Zoom webinar chat. So um, in the Q&A, um, we have a question that says, was it the case that George Washington insisted that Andre be hung as revenge for the hanging of Nathan Hale? Uh, I've heard something to that effect. Mm -hmm. However, if that is what Washington wanted, he was very clever. Because the thing that stands out to me is Washington distanced himself from the entire Andre thing. As angry or whatever as he might have been, he was shrewd, smart, political, whatever enough to say, I'm paraphrasing, I can't be involved in this. So he appointed a bunch of his uh, generals uh, and officers to be on like the courtroom trial committee. He wasn't there, he wasn't present. So like in hindsight or whatever, he's, he had nothing to do with it. So that might've motivated him. You'd have to look at like, what are his journals and stuff say, but on the surface, not at all. It wasn't even him who made the decision. He wasn't even there. There you go. Okay. So um, in one of the first maps that you showed that there, there, um, there was an island shown off Tarrytown. Did that disappear or yeah. was it connected via landfill? You know, there is a small chance uh, of something like that because, you know, the river is pretty, the river border now is pretty settled because we've got the railroad and, and boulders along the, the, you know, landfill. Back then, I imagine it might have been more uh, fluid or whatever. But my assumption for this island, and it even says Sarek Point. What's that? Right. So a couple of reasons for that. First is, uh, well, it's it was made by the British in 17... From their experience in 76, drawn up in 77. I don't even know if Claude Sothier and the later person who finalized it, William Faden, was even here. Maybe they just heard the stories of it. I don't know. Next. Well, that's as far as the British Army got. These red lines, are that's where the British Army was. And they swung around here, and maybe they went on the Tarrytown Road. I don't know. So they never even went there. So that's either an extension of Croton Point, uh, which you can kind of see from Tarrytown. Uh, so I wouldn't put too much emphasis into the, I wouldn't get out a, a compass with this map, like and go foraging for food because you won't survive. But as far as like rough outline and what, and what people thought, right? What did people think? There was a Terry town. That's what they thought. So it's there. What was important? Hook Mountain. So it's there. Okay. So um, another uh, participant wanted to know, what is the evolution of the term or village or town, the name, I guess, Terry town? Um, yep, give me just a second to think. Okay, so of course Irving says <laughs> that uh -huh. it, it's, we all know. <laughs> it's, you know we're, so we're laughing when we say it, uh, and we should, you know, I don't want to, it may sound like I'm picking on Irving, you know what, I have nothing but respect for the guy, it's brilliant, the stuff that he did, it's just we shouldn't take it as, you know, Irving said. Um, okay, so Irving says it's called Tarrytown because on market days, the, uh, the men who went to market in Tarrytown, they would uh, stay for a long time in the village tavern and their wives were annoyed at how long they would tarry or wait in the town. Ha <laughs> ha, funny Irving, it's pretty cool. Um, as far as other reasons offered in 1848, Robert Bolton Jr. said, it probably comes from the Dutch word for wheat, which is tarwe or tarve. So tarve town, the wheat town. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, Bolton, he tends to make up things just like Irving does. So you always got to take that with a grain of salt. By 1886 or so, John A. Todd in his history of Greenberg said, no way the place was that associated with wheat that you'd call the whole place Wheat Town or Tarway Town. Yeah. More likely it was from a John Terry or John Terry family of which there's a record of her moving in around 1690s or so from Long Island. And that, that does reflect a major migration pattern. Dutch settlers would go to Long Island or Midwout uh, I think Midwood, right, today. And then they would move up to this area. Um, but again, that's all speculation. The only written record is the Terrytown Company in, what did I say, September 2nd of 1775. So this is another one of those things. We don't know. There's a 1719 <laughs> map, I think, that has Tarwa Town on it. Oh, really? So I'll have to show you that next time you come. Uh, yeah, we'll take All right, I can't wait to get back in the archives. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
So let's see. Uh, okay, so I think you had it marked on the map, but can you repeat the actual capture of Andre location as opposed to the nearby monument as it is best known? Uh, yes, I'm also going to refer you to the Historical Society because mm -hmm. they are experts on that. Uh, as far as I can trace it down or figure out and the best I can remember, it's kind of like in a parking lot of the uh, Tarrytown School District at Sleepy Hollow High School by a fence and a gate with like pavement on top of it. And how remarkable, it's called the John Paulding School. <laughs> Next to the John Paulding School, that's right. So um, the road was moved over time. So even if you say, oh, it was by the road, well, you can't really use that as a reference point. Uh, even, let's see, where is the map that later John Romer must have drawn. Let's see if I can find it. Um, I'll try one more second. Even the place of capture is different from where they searched. And this was a map essentially drawn by John Romer of the Pewter Basin fame. So he, he just made a whole point of like they captured him and then they like dragged them off the road into the woods and searched and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, there's a difference between the capture and the search site and where the monument is now is not exactly where it happened. It's sort of an unglorified site now up by the John Paulding School. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, let's see. Um, it also says, uh, somebody just wanted to point out, you can read the history of, of Do the Dobbs Ferry in the newsletter of the Dobbs Ferry Historical Society. So if anybody wants to find any more information about Dobbs and the Dobbs, the ferry that went across the river, you can go check that out. Um, another person asked, why was Andre heading toward White Plains? Was this a safe route? anticipated a safe route on the way down? Yeah, so generally speaking, the British controlled the seas and the waterways. So it would have been safer to be along the east side of the county than the center of the county or, or along the Hudson River, perhaps. Um, you know, I think maybe it's just because like, the roads might have been bigger or more traveled, might have been a little more anonymous. Uh, it's hard to say. He's on his own and he's just kind of, well, I mean, Arnold calls it, sends him through White Plains. So we'd have to look into like, what was Arnold thinking as well? So obviously I don't have a very clear answer for that, but you know, the more you can stay either on a main road or more towards the east, you're probably a little more towards uh, British and loyalist protected areas. Again, I think it's fascinating that, you know, there he is in this, um, Basically, a kid shapes the destiny of the country when he's like, should I go this way? No, don't go there. Young's house. There's Patriot Outposts. So he, he decides to go through Tarrytown. OK, so we've got lots of questions. So I'm going to speed things up a little bit here. So. I'll go even quicker. <laughs> OK, so uh, why could Andre, sorry, Arnold, send Andre downriver in the boat that he later used? To, why, I'm assuming I mean couldn't Andre um, get, go downriver in the, in the vulture? Uh, short version, because Moses Sherwood and John Peterson fired at the boat, and then Livingston's cannon shot at it, and the vulture went down like part of the way. And at that point, uh, Andre already has to start making his way back. Then the ship moves further back up when, I don't know, maybe the Americans moved their cannon back or something like that. Yep. Okay, so um, there's another question. Um, where in the map was the Landrine house where Andre was held captive right after? That's another interesting story. Some stories say that, uh, where's the, hold on. Some stories say that he was held at the Landrine house. Mm -hmm. Also call, oh, I can use the Paulding map for that. Oh, I could, oh, you could use this one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not, oh, the Reed house is that, right? Reed house, no. yeah. Yeah. It is the Reed house. So the Land, Landrine house or the Reed house. Uh, has frequently been called the Andre House. On the earlier map that I showed you, it actually is labeled as that. So if you look right around here, it says Andre House. Oop, that's the Reed House or Landrine House. Mm -hmm. mm. I found conflicting sources. One said they went there. The reason I didn't, I don't buy that source is it said, see, he was sitting on the stoop and they offered him some food. And it was like a whole story that didn't seem all that well verified. Although again, it could totally be the truth. It also seemed to <laughs> conflict. The, the ones that told that story said, it's the first place they went, they didn't go anywhere else. Well, that's not what John Romer says, the guy who got the pewter basin. So again, there are many conflicting accounts. I just kind of chose to ignore it. 
Um, but it may be he went there also. Well, many people do think that he probably did go there, maybe wasn't there very long, and he may have been off for food. The same thing that happened uh, yes. later. So it's, exactly. just, you know, I mean, he, he they certainly traveled him around all over the county. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we got him to the final place. Um, do we have all the history markers we need for these events? And is there a school curriculum for these stories? Well, no, we don't have all the history markers. I will answer that question. The Historical Society actually put up all those history markers in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s, and about five of them are now missing. Um, they have been subsequently either taken down or destroyed or hidden or something. So we are actually on a, on a um, and I'm going to en enlist Eric to help me with this, because we are going to be putting back up our historical markers um, in many of the locations, including the location of uh, where J uh, John Paulding, the John Paulding <laughs> was actually born. There was one marker there. Um, we're gonna be putting one at the um, Acker House, um, uh, the Acker Forkel House and a couple of others. So um, Eric, you'll be hearing from me. So that's one that, you know, how, does that how does that fit into the history curriculum? So there you go. So the Revolutionary War shows up in the New York State, what they call the framework for the social studies. It shows up in, let's see, fourth grade, when the focus is things like my town or my community. It's kind of the fourth grade theme. It shows up in, let's see, I think it's seventh grade, when the focus really is, um, you know, some of, the, some of the, these Revolutionary War events. And it shows up in 11th grade when students study U.S. history again. And there... It, the way that I've treated it is there's a phrase they use, which is the Revolutionary War uh, affected individuals in different ways. And so I've used that and I've seized upon that to teach about the theme of causation, right? John Paulding's being their cause. You heard me in this presentation say like Tarrytown in a way helped to cause the United States. So causation as well as comparison. Individuals were impacted differently. For John Jack Peterson, the war gave him an opportunity he might not have had. And we don't know if he was enslaved or not, but uh, gave him a chance to, well, see the country, uh, assert his own kind of independence. And so that's how at least I treat it in 11th grade. Okay, there you go. So um, somebody also mentioned there was a major flood in the 1840s in the Croton River. Also, there are shoals extending out from Croton Point, which makes it a great fishing ground. <laughs> Just a little point taken. Okay, next question. Where was the Sugar House prison? Yeah, there were several prisons. Uh, I gotta admit, I spent so much time researching Tarrytown and Landrine houses and which road Andre went on. I haven't spent the time to figure out the difference between, let's see, there was the Sugar House prison, the North Dutch Church prison maybe, and possibly another. Uh, and to be honest, not exactly sure where they were located. Uh, somebody when we, we, at the Yonkers event we did, did say, oh, I know where that wall's from. And he mentioned the street name somewhere in lower Manhattan, but I forget where. Also, don't forget, when I say the British occupied New York City, I mean, basically, like, even below Wall Street, right? That, that's, so it had to be somewhere probably below there. Apparently, there were also prison ships in the harbor uh, at which people were kept, uh, one of which John Jack Peterson allegedly escaped from one of those. Mm -hmm. Somebody also had a comment, uh, speaking of women, I have read a modern newspaper account uh, um, that uh, Marita Martling Requa, Sergeant Daniel Requa's wife, saw Andre on his horse on the morning he traveled down the Bedford Road. Have you heard of that before? Is there any evidence of that? Or is that family folklore or? It would be self-serving of me to answer this question because I wrote that article. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yes, that's totally true. Um, again, a little, thank you for bringing up that detail. I, I cut it just to try and make our, but so there's Sergeant Daniel Requa's home. And apparently, Private Abraham Weekra was, you know, out doing whatever he was doing or whatever. And as Andre came down the road, his mom was like, who's that man coming down the road? And was like, you know, anyway, so she, she saw him and told him later, like, some unidentified man going down the road. You can read all about Private Abraham Requa in our Hudson Independent History Profile. So search for our Hudson Independent Historic. You should be able to track it down. Unless there's another article that, that I know of, but yes. And there are very, uh, uh, several people uh, said, thank you very much. They're wonderful. It's wonderful, fortunate to have you as a lead historian. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, you can kind of go through the chat on your own. Um, there is one question um, that actually probably is gonna come more to me than to you. And that's, what do we know about the tailors who donated the 
land for the Paulding Monument. The tailors are actually something, it's an article I am working on right now that's gonna be coming out, I think in February. Um, but um, Fergus actually sent that question and I am going to be in touch with you, Fergus, because I, I think you've also emailed me at the Historical Society. I have a whole article written about the Taylors who, um, they were former slaves um, who actually owned the property that's, that's now part of Patriots Park. Um, and they uh, were very uh, civic minded and they did donate the land in the 1850s. Um, that little small square there was part of their property uh, so that the, um, Monument Association could put up with the monument. So, um, but uh, so more on that coming in the future. So, I think um, I think hopefully I answered everybody's questions. If I didn't, um, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, uh, we had so many questions and we were kind of running out of time. So, thank you so much, um, everybody, um, and uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, and uh, my uh, fellow uh, panelists here, Eric, Philomena, and 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 Connie. Um, we all want to thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful presentation that, that Eric gave. And also thank you for joining us because we're so excited that you're interested in Revolutionary War history and the history of Tarrytown and the history of Westchester County, which is absolutely so rich with Revolutionary War history that you're going to be hearing a lot from, from Connie and from all of us over the next few years. So Sarah, thank you. Thank Sarah, thank you. You, you are the perfect person to do <laughs> Q and A, and I'm glad I didn't have to do it. But I thank I thank uh, Philomena. I think, and I also thank Maureen uh, Petri at Warner Library and our supporters in Westchester County. And um, yes, you can see our last slide here. You can find us, um, and we're, we'll be happy to be adding all of you to a mailing list. And uh, boy. Timing is perfect. <laughs> Philomena, do you have any last uh, word? Uh, we have one and a half minutes. <laughs> oh, I just want to say it was really exciting. I enjoyed the talk, Eric. And uh, I can see why you're the teacher of American history. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> right. I think there, one more question did come in about the enslaved people who were involved in the area. And I just want to let sure. people know that we are working on this. I know that Eric's also working on this and more will be coming about this. This is very important in the area. And, and now we're just starting to uncover a lot more information about the enslaved people who were working on, on both sides of the American Revolution. So they there will be more coming about that. And there's actually a couple of um, uh, things you'll be hearing hopefully uh, in the spring. So thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>